ask all the world leaders to hold their calls of good wishes to Tony until the event is over. Uh, my name is Denny Cummings. I'm chairman of the authors group, and I welcome you all here today. Uh, if you have cell phones or anything else that might make noise, this would be a great time to turn them off or silence them. And I want to tell you just about a couple of real fast coming events here. Tomorrow we have uh, Hedrick Smith, the New York Times reporter um, and Russia expert, coming for uh, his book. And then on Thursday we have uh, Dakota Meyer, who many of you know uh, won the Medal of Honor. He's the first Marine since Vietnam to have won the Medal of Honor. And uh, as you can imagine, his story is uh, just unbelievable. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. That's this Thursday. Well, many of you know a great deal about Tony La Russa because he is kind of a sh Chicago icon as well as St. Louis. And um, I looked at his bio, and I couldn't believe how many interesting things there were on there. So I could actually, in fact, I plan on speaking for about an hour and a half, just talking about Tony. Uh, as you know, as manager of the Chicago White Sox, Oakland A's, and St. Louis Cardinals, he's the third winningest baseball field boss of all time, surpassed only by legends Connie Mack and John McGraw. He played in the majors, and he wanted me to add, didn't have a major role in playing for the majors, but he played for the majors, ending his career in 1973 with the Chicago Cubs. And he managed in the minors until 1979. He began managing uh, in the majors with the Chicago White Sox, and then the Oakland A's, and finally with the St. Louis Cardinals. He has three World Series wins, six league championships, and five Manager of the Year awards. As an attorney, he hasn't had to practice that a whole lot, except between players and their arguments, I imagine. Uh, but he's also a committed community activist. Somebody told me, and I'm not 100% sure that this is right, but there are only like six managers that were attorneys. Does that sound right, Tony? And uh, four, at least four of them are in the Hall of Fame, as I recall. Um, I think that's a requirement now, that you have to have be an attorney. Uh, he and his wife, Elaine, have two incredibly neat daughters, Bianca and Devon. And it greats, gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Tony La Russa. Well, good afternoon. You know, I watched closely as we were signing books. A couple of people mentioned the, uh, that they were with the Cubs, and I looked directly at them when they were singing birthday, and instead of saying, Dear Tony, they said, Darn Tony. Um, I guess the idea is that uh, I, I would say a few things, and then I think the favorite part of it is just, just take questions, because I mean, I've been sitting there when somebody's up here, and then use all the time talking about stuff that you're not really interested in. And uh, so we'll do questions, and if there's not enough questions, I'll keep talking. <clears throat> but I think the place to start is here in Chicago. Um, after a, it really was lousy playing career, uh, I ended up as a player coach in the White Sox organization under a great man, Lauren Babe, uh, the farm director at the time was Paul Richards, and the general manager was Roland Heeman. The owner was Bill Veck. And uh, they gave me an opportunity, double-A, triple-A, and then I got a chance to come here right away and manage for Bill in 1980. In 81, Jerry Reinsdorf and A. Einhorn came over. And I think because they bought the club in January, it was too late to get a real manager. They, they let me stay around, and, and I, I learned a lot. We had a wonderful year in 83, but I learned a lot about what an organization is supposed to feel like. And uh, the book talks about Chicago, Oakland, and St. Louis. Uh, it's an environment that you create. Uh, in fact, I was listening to uh, the Ryder Cup. It's, one of my, it's my favorite competition is the Ryder Cup. So I'm in mourning like whoever else is interested in that. And Paul Asinger, Asinger however you say it, said that when he was the captain, 
What he tried to do is just to create this environment, and that's exactly what I learned, and that's what we try to do. The book talks about that, and it started here in Chicago. That's why when I got fired in 86, it was somebody kicking you out of the family, and for years, uh, my wife would not speak to Jerry Reinsdorf because she thought that he was responsible, and it turned out I had to explain to her, I mean, I could have been and should have been fired like 81, 82, <laughs> and even 83, the year we won, we, you know, we were under 500 in May, and, and Jerry really was the guy that, that stood beside us. So um, the book talks about the relative importance of Moneyball and human nature and heart, guts, and t chemistry. Um, but what happened was, you know, I'm mean, like in 06, we won. To this day, I've never seen the first replay of our postseason run. Not once. Why? Because as soon as it's over, you're thinking about 2007. And you get the offseason stuff, and you just, now this year, when it was over, you know, then I was done. And uh, there was a fascination. And, I mean, the good fans, the casual fans, and even somebody that I think maybe the last day of the year that it was so exciting in four different cities to see who would qualify that that must have sparked some interest because the postseason played on. I mean, in our part, we had a dramatic game five, one nothing game with Carpenter and Halliday, and then we played against Milwaukee and had a really, it's a very close series of Rangers. Could have gone either way, went our way, as you know, it was dramatic there at the end. Kept getting asked, you know, our comeback to get there, we were 10 and a half games back. It was historic. We came back and got into the last day. So how did you make the comeback? And how did your team win as the underdog? And the more I thought about it, for the first time, I had a chance. So I really went back and thought, and there's a lot of compelling stuff. Uh, it's really a story about a team that embraced uh, the things that you hope for. Uh, and then by the time we got into the competition, these were so tough, and it sounds corny, they just refused to lose. They had this tremendous will that they developed throughout the season because adversity will get you stronger and we lost Wayne Wright right away and you know it goes on and on till the end so my favorite way to explain it was that uh, game six you know we're down by two runs in the ninth and there's one strike left well how'd you guys do it and, and the fact was that by then we had already passed that test I mean there's seven or eight times in the month of September and the playoffs where we're that close to being eliminated so by game six, our guys, I mean, they just had no doubt that they were going to keep. Now, if Texas would have gotten that last out, we would have tipped our cap, but they were not going to be denied. So I, the story is, uh, I think it's compelling because it really honors uh, the, the players. Uh, and because of Harper Collins, whenever I explain anything like chemistry, I'll give you an example. There's some people who think chemistry is not important, but you spend more time with your family baseball than you do your real family for eight months. So you think it's not important that guys have this bond? And my first general manager, Roland Heeman, one time told me, he said, if you have true chemistry on a club, it's like the general manager trades for a number one pitcher, a great run producer, or a terrific closer. It's that impactful. It's like a, you know, I don't think he used it, but somebody said, like, it's a tangible, intangible. So that's what we had. And we talk about how, it, how that gets built. Uh, I think about Paul Richards. I don't know if you remember him. He was already 70 years old. He was the, the farm director. And he had done everything in baseball. But he was really, really sharp. And, you know, he's a tall Texan, spoke with a drawl. And uh, maybe you'd enjoy my first uh, experience as a manager of AA in 1978. It was just like this. In those days, you usually introduce your minor league team to like a Chamber of Commerce luncheon. So we had we were in Knoxville, Tennessee in the Southern League and had a big crowd, you know, it's the, the, the town's team. And we had a real good young team. So Paul is introducing it. And he's speaking his drawl and he's bragging about Harold Baines and Britt Burns and I mean, Richard Dotson guys end up being stars. I mean, a really good team. And so as he gets to the end, he says, well, if you all wondering about this outstanding team, and you may have noticed that we got this guy here who's never managed before, but never worry because it's true that the worst players make the best managers. He's got a chance to be an outstanding manager. 
So I'm sitting there, I thought, man, he just took a shot at my career, but, you know, truth hurts. Well, that night, first game as a manager. That night, I mean, that ended up to the last day. You have a one-run lead in the ninth. You're sitting there, and, you, I mean, you can't breathe. You can't swallow. Your stomach hurts. Your head's pounding because you're three outs away from having a really good day. We won, and you enjoy for about 15 minutes. But if you lose it, then you get to go through all that. Well, what if this? What could I have done? Boy, what can we drive in the run? Why didn't we? Blah, blah, blah. You know, so that one-run lead. And Paul explained to all us young managers, most important game decision you make is handling your bullpen. So he wanted to give us tips. So we still, you know, students. And I'll never forget, he says, the best managers, they make the move ahead of the damage. And so you look for the keys that, hey, it's about to happen. You go, whoa, you're out. Next. And he had two of them in particular. So I'm watching that first game, boy. And I'm one run lead. I said, please, I just want to win this first game. Just want to enjoy this one. And sure enough, I see our pitcher do this both things to the leadoff hitter. He throws a fastball that had been having a little hop, and now it just kind of drifts. And it's kind of saying, hit me. <laughs> so that guy gets on base. So the next guy gets on base, and he had a breaking ball that was snapping, rolling the top of the strike zone, and it's saying, hit me. <laughs> so I said, hey. I'm going to get him before this game's over. So I walk out there and point to the bullpen. Guy comes in, bam, bam, we give it two runs, we lose. So I go in the clubhouse, and I'm sitting there. You know, I'm disappointed, really disappointed, but I know we have a good team. I'm mostly concerned about the quality of my decision. So I'm thinking, you know, what's Paul thinking? Did he see what I saw? Was it a good move, bad move? So Paul walks in. Man, I'm sitting in my, my little locker room there, look up. He says, boy. I said, yes, sir, Mr. Richards. You may have been a better player than I thought you were. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I mean, I have a bunch of stuff that I can talk about, so if, if the questions don't fill it, I'm going to just start talking. So anybody got a question to start with? Because I, I, I know that most of the time it's more fun answering what you're answering. Yes, sir. Well, if you're analyzing what's going to make a good manager, and I realize St. Louis still have Carpenter and Berkman on the bench keeping those guys fired up in the main inning. But do you think Matheny's going to be a great manager? Will we be here 15 years from now listening to Mike Matheny? Uh, well, it's unusual. I mean, when you, there's a thing among coaches if you're five years in one place. That's long because people get tired of you. And I was just, um, 10 years with Oakland. Now, the thing of difference is in California, people don't pay attention, they don't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was a couple of years we lost, and they remember two years ago, hey, you guys are doing great. I said, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> now, St. Louis is different. That's a religion to be there 16 years is. Uh, the key is what was true in. Chicago, Oakland, St. Louis, and this is like my, I have great friends, Tom Kelly and Jim Leland. That's why the career wins I don't even talk about because I've been lucky. If you have great owner, great front office, and you get players, you have a chance to win. And when Kelly and Leland had that, they win. Uh, and I've never been in a bad situation, ever. So I think in Mike's case, uh, what he lacks is experience mostly game experience making those decisions and I know I mean I've talked to him a few times he's what do you think about that and, and one, it's nice to have a go-to guy you'll see in the book game two of the World Series uh, we were winning one nothing the leadoff guy got on and I did not defend the running game with Kinsler because I was worried about Mott walking Andros and that's what I did and he ended up stealing and we two and we lost so I called my friend Leland it's nice to have somebody tell you the truth, so I've told Mike the truth. Well, yeah, that was okay. What were you thinking? He explains it. The thing you got to remember is the other side has talent. They're trying to win too. So sometimes you do it right, they just beat you. Well, in Mike's case, I mean, he's, he's learning to pull the trigger on some of those decisions. He's learning to run a game. But what he has is he has a, a wonderful 12-year background as a really good competitor who is a catcher. So he understands that part of it. 
He's got terrific leadership qualities. Guys believe him, they respect him, and they want to play for him. So my answer is, yeah, I think he'll be around quite a long time. Now, I'll tell you the one thing, by the way, Sparky Anderson, I went to advice to when I got the job of managing. I said, Sparky, I need some help, man. I mean, I wasn't a very good player. He says, yeah, I know. And uh, <laughs> I haven't managed the minor leagues very well. I said, yeah, I know that, too. He says, again, he says, yeah, rent, don't buy. <laughs> but so I don't know. I think Mike's going to be fine. Yes, sir. Um, I think the shorter the series, the more important it is if you can have, you got to have one because the other team's going to have one. Normally, so you might win a best of five. That's why we work so, always so hard. Uh, in a book, we'll talk to you. We were playing Philadelphia, and Carp won the last day of the year to get in. We brought him back with three days rest in game two so that if we got to game five, he'd be the guy. And as it turned out, uh, you won. I mean, there have been a lot of times <clears throat> that we've set up the series that no matter how you end the season, your number one guy's got to pitch twice or you've got no chance. When you play seven games, you need more than one for sure. Uh, one's not enough. And, uh, you know, I was just in St. Louis. You know, I mean, they're, they're going to get in. They'll play Atlanta Friday. And uh, who's going to start that game? I mean, it's a big – topic because everything in with the Cardinals is a big topic I mean even the guy who's the 25th player on the bench the fans will argue about that because they know uh, and my answer was there's four guys that they might pick Loesch would be on time has had the best season you got Wainwright who's had some sluggish times but he is a champ you got Carpenter back now he's pitched two good games and they got this kid named Lance Lynn Pitch yesterday got his 17th win. So my point is, if you got four guys that you pick from, you're a dangerous club. Now, you got to get by that game, but when they get into the next round, they're going to have a good start every day. So whoever, you know, they know more than anybody. Whether they, you know, they're something low. Some people are saying Wayne right because I wouldn't pitch Carp just because I, I don't know if it's fair to him yet. But uh, they're in a good situation. And I, I can't say publicly that I would pitch Wainwright because that, that would not be a fair thing to say. <laughs> I'm just, just, just throwing a little some fire out there. No, I'm serious. <laughs> you know, Mike needs to have that kind of controversy where people are second guessing him. It's, it's healthy for him. No, I don't know. He, whatever they say, but you know, they say Deloche right now. He's, he's probably the, the choice makes the most sense. Yes, sir. Will we see you back in baseball? Um, you know. In my bag, I've got a credential that says Office of the Commissioner. And i got a picture. And all it does is give me the ballpark for free. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm working for MLB. I'm his assistant. He sends me on assignments. And uh, so I've been seeing more games all over. Um, I keep getting asked about managing. I, not one time this year have I wanted to be a manager again. Zero. But I miss the winning and losing a lot, because for 50 years, you wake up in the morning, it's all about the game, win, aha, uh -huh, lose, oh, crap. <laughs> so uh, I think at some point I'll be in somebody's office, you know, get back to winning. And no disrespect to MLB and the commissioner, but, you know, I like the winning and losing, and, but not managing. Yes, sir. I love it. Love it. Because, uh, and not because... The 14 man committee is on field committee, Commissioner Seelix. I'm on a, they got four managers Leland, Sosha, Tory, myself. They got four general managers, four owners, George Will and Frank Robinson. And Tory's the guy that brought this up, and everybody right away says, You're right. We won as a wild card last year. It's happened way too many times. And the whole point is that winning the division over six months is not a big enough advantage versus the wild card. In fact, you're seeing it right now, Yankees and the Orioles. It happened, Yankees and uh, Red Sox or something in the past. When you got to the end, it made no really no, you know, you'd like to be a division winner, but you really wanted to be strong for the playoffs, and that's not right. So now there isn't anybody 
that doesn't want to win the division because they don't want to go into this one game out. So number one, it definitely accomplishes priority one, which is prize the regular season division winner. And then secondly, it's had the uh, effect of, of making it another hoop for the wild card to get through, which I think is fair. Um, there was talk about, well, one and out. We tried two out of three, but that pushes the teams that are waiting. I mean, they got, that's too long for them. That's not fair to them. And what's wrong? You know, that's how it is in football. It's in basketball. You know, you, you, and what I, I've heard some of these teams in the wild card complain. I said, fine. You don't want to just pass it on to the next team. If it scares you, <laughs> just shut up and play. You're lucky to get in there. But we're only, we're only getting 10 of the 30 teams in playoffs. I mean, that compares really well to basketball and hockey and football. So I love it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, I mean, you have children? You have another one? Which one do you prefer? <laughs> no, it's just, uh, I mean, I, I never won a World Series in Chicago, and I would never say that I enjoyed St. Louis more than Oakland, more than St. Louis, as Chicago. I mean, they're all really special, and the moments, I mean, like Chicago, if you're a manager, you never know if you can ever take a team to the postseason. So 83 will always and forever have that magic for me. You never know if you can win a World Series, so 89. And then you have the two in St. Louis where we were, you know, the underdog both times. And somehow you, you get through that. How about this one? As you, as, you know, there's a the cart in the White Sox table over there. Not enjoying themselves very much this morning. <laughs> and I don't blame them because I wasn't happy. But uh, in 1983, we win the West, Baltimore wins East. Best of five, go to the World Series. Now you're best of five. Well, if you're a walk-out team's best of one, then best of five, best of seven. So it's, it's – uh, I didn't appreciate how easy it was to get there, but I appreciate how tough it is now. It's just the most exciting time of all. And I've had uh, every place, great players, great moments. But when you talk about – Game six to be a part of that one. People say maybe the, you know it's one of the in the conversation the greatest World Series of all time. But I was you know I was can't really say that I was doing anything except vomiting in the corner. So it's hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, the first thing I do, I don't talk about a tree. I push them off the ledge. <laughs> Say, hey, we're trying to win here. Uh, no, that's a, it's a <coughs> um, losing. I mean, that's part of the adversity <coughs> that separates teams. So, is, so are injuries, how you handle mistakes. But <coughs> the team that doesn't understand that you're going to get your heart broken, the pitcher or the player that doesn't understand that you're going to fail and can't handle it, that's why I say if there's one quality that you need to be a productive major leaguer, it's, it's physical and mental toughness. You've just got to be tough enough to, to deal with it and figure out what you did wrong and come back the next day fresh. Now, you, part of that is for those who fail and they say, hey, what's the big deal? Well, you don't want those guys because you've got to understand that there's an expectation, and if you, if you fail, you need to replay it and learn. So what I try to do all the time is if, if somebody struggles or lost, you know, you, you go to them and you try to see wh you know, where they are. If they're fine, you pat them on the back. If you see they're hurting, and I'll give you a great example. It's in the book. I mean, that's what I mean about this story. There's compelling stuff that sounds like it's Hollywood. I'll give you an example. We were making our run there at the end, and... Ten and a half, and we beat the Braves. We came against the Braves. Three, seven and a half, we sweep them. Now it's four and a half with games to go. So we keep boom, 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 boom. We come to the last homestand. We've got three with the Mets, three with the Cubs, and then we go on the road to play. Like right now, we go to play Houston. Mets come to town. We beat them on Tuesday. 
Tuesday and Wednesday. Thursday, the Braves are off, and we're a game and a half out, right? We have a 6-2 lead in the ninth. We bring our closer in. He walks the first guy, bad. Next guy hits a ground ball to Furcal. Now, we would have no chance to be that close without Furcal. When he got him, he really solidified him in the field and really helped us. Plus, as I found out later, for three veterans, for Cal Rhodes and Dotel had never been in a World Series and won it. So they were, I mean, they really injected, let's go. For Cal does this on a ground ball. Just careless. Now it's first, instead of two outs, nobody on game over, it's two outs, I mean, it's two guys on base. They score six. We lose eight to six. It's exactly the question you asked. So I go into clubhouses, is, you know, like a morgue. So when you do that, you walk in there and you just, you know, you don't have a meeting, you just walk in there and you say stuff. Now I had, I had told everybody, we have three series left. If we win the three series, two out of three, that way it's a, it's a reasonable goal. We win two out of three, I guarantee we'll have at least a playoff against Atlanta. I didn't know, but you gotta say something like that, you know? <laughs> so I walk in there, I said, hey, what's, I mean, I said, you know what, what is around here? We don't go for this, oh, so depressed, discouraged, so frustrated. Get mad, because that's energy, right? So I'm there, and, and for cows, everybody turns around, listens to me, you know, okay, let's go. I said, we won this area, you believe in me, don't you? No, yes, they do. <laughs> I said, let's go. I mean, let's go have, you know, it's a day game, go have some, dinner with your families come out, got the Cubs coming out tomorrow, win that series, beat Houston, guarantee we're in. For cow has his back, and I know he's hurting. So I walk by, you know, and I tap him, you know, go there, and go, mm -hmm. he didn't say anything. That night I get a call from Albert Pujols. And Albert says, you need to call for Cal, he wants to quit. He's going to quit because he just cost us our chance. Because we lost, now we're two games back instead of one. So I call him, leave a message, no answer. Next morning Albert calls me, which was Friday. Did you talk to her for Cal? I said, I left him a message. He hadn't called me back. Just call him again because I'm going to go over to his house. So I called him again, you know, left a message. Rafael, I need to talk to you. So whatever time you come in, come in half hour earlier. So he called back, he says, I'll be there. So he comes in, I mean, he talking about, I mean, he's just broken hearted, which is good. He's taking accountability, he thinks he messed up. And so I go through the whole thing, you know, hey, we wouldn't be here without you. Yeah, man. So I make him feel a little better. That night, I didn't play him. Just to give him a, you know, mental rehab day, right? Well, Soriano, it's a home run, they beat us. And Atlanta wins their last game, so now we're three games out with five to play. The next day we're playing the Cubs. We're losing one nothing in the ninth. We lose that game, we're, we're, you know, we're done. We score two runs, we got a hit with one out, we, I pinch ran, stole base, got a third, three strikes out, then we get two, three walks in a row, the score, wild pitch, we win it. If you see that, that the guys exploded more than they did in win the World Series, it was just wonderful. So now we're one and one. The next day we're playing the last game as the Cubs, we're losing by one in the seventh. Yadi hits a home run. Bottom of the eighth for Cal, it's one about 400 feet to win it. Now here's a guy who's going to quit, hits a home run, and when it's over, you know, we, get, we have to go to Houston, and he's happy, and he's the guy that invented happy flight. You know, happy flight, he's smiling. There's a guy that was going to quit. I mean, that's Hollywood. It actually happened. And he hits the home run. The Braves lose. We're only down one going to the last. So how do you do it? You, <clears throat> you get close to the guys. I mean, I, I'm sure I'll mention at some point, but we build this personalizing style. You establish a relationship with each guy. I mean, one-on-one -on -one kind of thing, each coach. And you get to know, you know. The last thing is, as a manager, if, if you have a really tough loss, I, I also mentioned this in the book, that's true, you know, then you walk around, especially if you're on the road, you walk around a tough neighborhood and you hope somebody tries to mug you. <laughs> yes, sir. Like Bertucci's neighborhood.
That's a great question. I'm, you know, I'm on the outside looking in with one exception. Um, their first base coach is Dave McKay. And we were together from 86 to last year, and he's talking about a great coach. Got more integrity than any coach I've ever been around in my life. And I know they love him there. And he's been telling me since spring training, he really likes Dale, likes the coaches. He likes their attitude. I mean, they're really working to do it right. Uh, and then, you know, because I'm not going to put him in a bad position, uh, I know, you know, Theo believes in the analytics. And you're a fool not to understand that with all the information now that you need some of it. But I'm on the outside. I don't know if it's analytics. I know the guys that he hired are, are guys that believe in it too. That, that there's a value to, to being in uniform and, and being able to mix in some observations about, like, David Eckstein. You know, ever since he was with us, he was the, the MVP in our 06 championship. Ever since he was with us, which is like the last four or five years, anybody that I talk to about toughness, and I say, well, he's tough, he's David Eckstein tough. David Eckstein's the toughest guy in the world. Well, he was a walk-on in college. Low draft choice. Everybody couldn't make it, couldn't make it. He's playing two world champions. I mean, he throws the ball. I mean, if there's a young, young guy here, did I see a young kid? I guarantee the young guy has more ability. But he's so tough. Well, you're gonna, you got to measure that. Analytics, you never put him on your team. He's, he's been on two champions. So my long-winded way to I, – I hope – it's like to me, the, the, the Cubs – my dad and mom taught me about the big dream. My whole career starting out, they wanted me to be a dreamer. I mean, because it was baseball, I wanted to be on a world champion. You know, sometimes it comes true. The biggest dream right now is the Cubs. You know, they haven't played, they haven't won in a long time. That's the big dream. So my suggestion would be that they have some, some balance between thinking that and this is what they tell you, and I'm not saying they do, but a guy in St. Louis was with us, literally came up and said, I, we get great information. We can write your lineup. We can tell you when to bunt, not bunt, when to steal, how to use your bullpen. I said, really? <laughs> no, how can you do that? You got to watch the game that day. Some guys are sluggish, some guys quick. The wind's blowing in around. I mean, it's such a phony concept, and money ball is the worst. Because you watch that movie, what is it? If you watch that movie, they won 20 in a row and won the division, and it's all about a first baseman that was a catcher. They got on base with walks and never drove in but one run and one stupid trade. Did they make, they talk about the three pitchers? And to hide the MVP, well, those guys were all scouted by human beings, developed in a system. That's why they won. It's not because of a computer telling you who to play. As you can tell, I mean, that one, that one gets me going. <laughs> and I, I saw this the other day, too. I, I watched George Will in a speech, and he used it, and I heard somebody on TV repeat it. The beauty of, of uh, statistics or analytics you can torture them enough to they confess anything you want them to say. <laughs> so be careful with them. Yes, sir. Um, about 10 years ago or so, I know Scott Rowland was one of your favorite ball players. Um, and somehow, some way, he got into your suburban doghouse, and I'm using what the paper said. All right. Uh, one of the Cardinals was uh, interviewed, and they asked about that, and I forgot who it was. Uh, but that particular Cardinal responded, if you're going to play for Tony, you got to come out and be prepared to play. So there's two questions I ask, I'd like to ask you. Number one, what does that mean? And number two, how do you get in your doghouse? Because it sounds like you've always been a very supportive manager, even when the ball players were in trouble uh, with uh, whatever. Uh, you've always been very supportive, and the ball players always loved you. Well, that's a great question. A lot to it. Number one, you know, my wife and I in 19. 91 started the Animal Rescue Foundation, so anybody goes in our doghouses, that's the best that I can do to them. <laughs> and I mean it. I, the better I can treat you, the, the, the nicer the doghouse. So um, with Scott, that was a painful, uh, painful memory and still is. Uh, Scott is a tremendously talented third baseman. He's had some injuries that's really taken away from his career, but he's still, when he's healthy as a play, he's a real force. In fact, I, I one time, I, I'm a, I love defense, and I once said, I wish I could 
manage a game or see a game where 27 balls were hit just got rolling. He's great. What happened was that he had a shoulder injury. And without getting into all of it, the way it was diagnosed and treated and then retreated, he had big problems with our doctors and our trainers. And he knows that I didn't have any part of it. And in fact, I didn't play him days that he wanted to play because I was worried about him. But what happened there at the end when he started really getting on everybody, I said, wait a minute, now, you know, we're part of this organization and you just can't run them down. So I, I defended them as a whole, not his situation, because maybe he had something. I said, but you can't be talking to them like you're doing, and that's not right. So, you know, he got on the other side of it, and, and he did not like being corrected. So, and, uh, you know, so we were estranged. And, but here's the, the PS of that, because you just said a support. And this is my, uh, if you read the epilogue of the book, I said, uh, I actually wrote that word for word myself. The other guys I had help in places. Uh, my two favorite parts of that, the one is I said, you know, I'm gonna keep asking about legacy. And I said, I think uh, whatever my legacy is, there are two parts to it. You just mentioned one, which is a pet peeve, is that you gotta be prepared to play. No. They said, you know, Tony's a prepared manager, his teams are prepared. That's okay. That just means studying for the test. What I think we've done really, really well, well in all those 30 years, we take the preparation into the competition. We compete like maniacs. And if you want to play, and I don't think I'm, I mean, I learned this from other guys. I'm not the only one, but that's, you need to compete. You need to go out there and try to effort and execution. So you might, you might be a great practice player and you go out there and, hey, what's happening? You know, you don't play. So part one is we compete. The second part, and this is the one I said is the most important to me, and, uh, and I think people that don't know it are surprised because they, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in that school like, you know, Belichick's and those guys, you know, they, they don't make a big deal publicly, you know, you don't, it's, you're, it's not about you, it's about the players. In the 30 some years, I said the most important thing is the relationships that we have developed. And this may surprise you because you think that you know, a couple months, I mean, maybe in 30 years, I've got a handful of guys that if they're walking down the street and they see me, they're going to go a different way. Handful. I probably have 2,000 players. We have, because of our staff and the ownership and all this, we have a great relationship, chemistry. To this day, if I walk into Luzinski or Rudy Law or any of those guys, we put arms around each other. Same thing with St. Louis. Same thing with Oakland. So, that surprises a lot of people, but we really work at it. We work at that, that tightness and that closeness. And I, and, uh, and I believe now in today's baseball, today's sports, same thing in your business. The tighter you get, the more you handle all those distractions out there in professional sports. Family and agents and friends are telling the guys, get yours, get yours. Chase the fame and fortune, and oh, by the way, but what about your team? We, we work every day the message, team, 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 team. Out the bottom drops your money and, and your attention. Yes, sir. McGuire is one of the neatest guys, one of the shyest guys you ever meet. Uh, and it pained me during that time because the media. You know, I'm not a big media guy just because they, and it's not personal. But, you know, they, they think it's, if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. So it's got to be something. They cook up the controversy or they focus on the controversy, and they don't think people care about good things and what's really happening. For example, during that time, McGuire was surly and not communi not, didn't communicate, and Sammy was the cat's meow. Well, what happened with Mark is, first of all, he's, he's shy. Secondly, he's a team guy. So he would come into a game after hitting a home run, and we lose. And they want to make a big fuss. He says, hey, we just got beat. I mean, this, we, can't, we can't be celebrating this thing now. Or he'd come in after we won 7-1, to one, and he had a home run to, seven, to be the seventh, and there's like Brian Jordan or Ray Langford or Delano De Shields. He said, no, it's about them. Well, McGuire isn't cooperating. Well, Sammy, <laughs> and, you know, it's not bad. He's a, he's a colorful person. That's what he was. But Sammy, you know, we have a thing that we always had this uh, T-shirt in my locker that I would have given to Sammy a lot. 
He says, dig me like I dig myself. <laughs> well, the press, they say, oh, look at him. He gives us, because that's what they wanted. McGuire was, was easy. He was wonderful. He was a teammate that way in Oakland, that way in St. Louis. And as he comes as a coach, he's, he's, the team has led hitting for three straight years because he didn't care what I owed about him. It's all about the players, which is the number one coaching philosophy. He's a piece of cake. He's a wonderful guy. Yes, sir. Jerry is exactly right. Uh, in fact, he's, that's one of the guys that, uh, you know, over the years you don't you lose touch with. And, uh, and, and we ha Jerry and I have a long history because they sent him over to Dominican to see our players and see whether I could manage. And his endorsement helped me get the job. Uh, that particular incident is in the book. And I'll tell you how, you know, I mean, I, I want to make sure I get this all in, but we won on the last day of the season. We got in on that great day. And Bray's lost. So that's Wednesday. Thursday, we're off. Friday, we're going to Philadelphia to work out. And Saturday, we start. So now, as it happens, and it happened quite a few times, when you get in, you have the day after, there's usually a day off. You know, my family's always in California. So I've got a day to just, wow, we got in. Because I love, anybody loves October. You know, it's the most fun you can have is participating in the playoffs. So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, man, we got in. I can't believe, because I was sure. Atlanta was going to win, and we'd have a one-game playoff. Well, they did, and they lost. We're in. We, we pulled this. So I'm sitting there thinking, wow, and I think back on Thursday, to the, and I knew it was my last year. I knew I was going to retire. So I was thinking about this is the end of all of it, but this is the end in St. Louis. I think about my first year. First year in 1996, it was not the Cardinals that, that were famous for being team and in fact, why did he quit in 1990? He says, I can't, I can't, these guys don't listen to me. I can't deal with these guys anymore. Tory, after five years, was quoted saying, you know, it's so good to come to New York where these guys pay attention and they want to play. So I walked into that situation. And they had, the, you know, the clicks and all this kind of crap. But they had some really good, talented guys. And I'm pushing my message because that's why Walt brought me in there. I had Dave Duncan, I have Dave McCain. We're pushing it and we're getting this result. It's, I mean, it's tough. Uh-oh, running out of time. <laughs> Are you running out of time? So, uh, so it's, it's, it's a great story. I, I, you know, we're talking about how you have to invest in, in practicing and then playing and coming together. And, and we were getting resisted. So I noticed that the Bulls, we were coming to Chicago to play the Cubs. The Bulls had played on Saturday and Sunday, the first two games against Miami. And I knew they were there working out. I called Jerry, and I called Jerry, and I called Phil, and got the okay. I brought seven guys with me, our young studs, plus George Hendrick, a coach, Ozzy, and Willie McGee. And I, we, we got up there in, at the Bertel Center. We were up on the platform, and they were like, you know, styling around the shots, you know, because they didn't really want it. But I had seen, I had the good fortune when I was with the White Sox to see Michael practice. It's the most amazing practice player of all time who's a great player. It's amazing what he puts into those things. I knew it. So the guys there, so Michael, what he does, is he goes out there, whatever the drill, he's first. Anybody half steps, he's, come on, let's go. We got a lot, you know, I mean, he's beautiful. So an hour and 15 minute workout, and now the guys are hanging over watching him. To this day, in fact, I almost, I asked Jerry for his number to call Michael, just to thank him again. When, when we walked out, we actually went into the weight room, and the guys stopped by to say hello to our guys. Uh, and then they caught the plane for Miami. And I know, because later on, the guy says, boy, you know, Michael and Scotty actually said hello to you. So maybe you're not the jerk we thought you were. <laughs> so the truth is, we ended up, that day, I thought we started to make some headway. We ended up winning the division. Beat San Diego was one game away from uh, winning the world, uh, winning the championship. And I give the Bulls and thank the, thank the leadership and Michael the credit they deserve. It's a great story. All right. Well, I see a lot of hands. Now, you're going to have to tell them no more. Wait, one more. One more. Okay, one, one more.
I was mentioned? Perfect. I will. Who, who wrote the book? Who wrote the book? Howard Bryant. Howard Bryant. Yeah. Yeah, I know who he is. Well, let me ask you a question. You see, in the old days, I'm, I'm going to answer the question. In the old days, weight training was not part of it. Uh, Dave McKay, coach of the Cubs, was one of the very first day in his career, first, first guys in his career, that started doing calisthenics and working out, running before he ever came to the park. So when I got there in 1986, in my career, I had had a lot of injuries. So when I went home during the winter, the guy who does at a gym, he got me working on some weights just to strengthen these areas that keep, kept breaking. So I had my own personal experience. So in 1986, we, did, we only did a little bit by the White Sox, by the way, but we already did it because Carlton Fisk was famous at the end of the day from going in at night and he would work out with weights. So I had seen Carlton Fisk and the point is if you work out, any of us work out religiously, you get bigger and stronger. So we go 86, I have Dave McKay and Dave McKay is the proponent. So all those first years we had a major advantage because we started a weight training program with Dave McKay running it and our guys invested in it guys like Walt Weiss, Carney Lancer, and we had a major advantage in strength and stamina. Now on that team was Conseco, McGuire came that next team, uh, next year. Now, what I have said every time, and I'll say it again, you can believe it or not believe it, it I'm just telling you, I'll put my hand on the, on the Bible. The Oakland A's and later on St. Louis Cardinals never, ever, ever allowed anything illegal to go on in our weight training program. And I know it's true because I was there enough and I know that Dave McKay ran it. At the time, and this is one of those stories that doesn't get out, creatine was a major, major substance, still legal, was then. And if there were articles, the magic, well guys put this creatine in powders, it enhanced your workout, and guys got stronger, and the workouts were more efficient. What happened? Creatine was found to dehydrate muscles. Guys were pulling their muscles, so you backed off it. So for a long time, when we saw guys getting stronger, creatine, I mean, it was a joke about you take the, the blender on the road before you pack the gloves. And, it was, and you saw this. Now what happens? Around the late 80s, early 90s, Two things happened. Guys got big and strong without working and quickly. And a guy like Caminetti first mentions this. So now we start looking, we know in our program, and uh, I'll guarantee we never ever did we allow anything, but we started watching, and Conseco, for example, was one of the guys, he quit working as hard, and he got bigger and stronger. And when he was challenged on it, he would make a laugh. He said, well, I've got, you know, I've got a secret. Now, what was happening at that time was pro football, and I'm sure some of the guys went for it. Well, here's a PS to that story, and, I'm, and I'll, whatever, I'll, I'll read the book and see what Brian says. When any of us in uniform pushed it upstairs, whatever happened at the general manager or owner level, I'm not sure. But I know what happened mostly Anybody that mentioned it, the union said, uh-uh. Right of collective bargaining and right of privacy. So in those years, they, they, they blocked every effort to have testing early. And so then they came across it was because the owners were greedy. Or well, maybe they were. Maybe they liked the home runs. But I'm telling you, for a uniform person, we knew. And to this day, if you see Mark McGuire, Mark McGuire is big and strong, hits home runs in batting practice. And he doesn't use anything. He hit 49 as a kid before he, did, he started into the big programs. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a terrible mark on our times. I don't know how you deal with the stuff that happened when somebody does it now. 
Kirk Gibson says they ought to double, and I, it shouldn't be 50, it should be 100. And the second time, you're, you're banned from baseball. I'm all, I'm all for it. It's not a problem nearly anymore because there is legitimate testing. But during that time, um, when we noticed, we spoke up. Now, beg your pardon? No, no, they used substances. They actually, there's no doubt they used substances. Pitchers use it, hitters use it. It's a terrible time in our sport. But you said you never do anything about it There wasn't in a, no, what, I just, didn't I just say that? I never, we didn't do anything of that in our clubhouse. We suspected when guys got bigger and stronger, and, but I don't know, to this day I don't know. I know that in our clubhouse we never used anything. We suspected, we pushed it upstairs, it went nowhere for a long time. Eleven, eleven years. Eleven years. Uh, he gave away something that you can't buy. What are your thoughts on that? Blame the system. Albert tried to Albert uh, tried to give the St. Louis Cardinals a sixty-five million dollar discount, so he's not a bad guy. Um, but the the Angels were printing money because of their TV contract, and they wanted a franchise player, and they offered him two hundred and sixty million dollars. So. <laughs> I think you can't forget what Albert was for 11 years, plus the best teammate and best citizen in our community. To this day, nobody has ever worked harder to, to give back than Albert Pools. And what I said recently, because I, if I had stayed there, and I couldn't because I was done, I think there's a 50-50 chance that I might have been able to persuade Bill to offer this contract and Albert to accept it. But that contract would have been five years had a lot of money. I don't know if Bill would have gone for it. I think maybe he could have, maybe. I don't know if Albert would have accepted it because 10 years was out there. I think maybe. But in, uh, what you have today, that's why, except for a team like the Yankees with Jeter, they're, they're paying him more money than, than he, you know, at this point he's productive, but they print money. Most teams have got to be very careful what they do beyond the three or four years, and the, the current thing is if you have a franchise player, it's seven, eight, nine, ten years. And I said the other day on ESPN, if I was in the front office, I'd never sign anybody over five years unless you print money. And there's only about a handful of teams that do that. Thank you very much.